scrapes, more tight spots than any person alive and a lot of them who aren't living. Well, now, Bob, you're on, and incidentally, you can't talk with a cigarette in your mouth. It's tough. You're on, but tell me, the last time we met, you were strictly a photographer, but now, after reading your new book, Slightly Out of Focus, that's the title of the book, I repeat, uh, it's not a literary criticism of the book, Slightly Out of Focus is the title, uh, you've stopped being just a photographer. You've become a writer as well. H how do you feel about this new life of yours? Oh, Tex, I don't know. I can tell you that when my book came out, fortunately, I wasn't here. So I wasn't sweating it out at all. I was in Moscow, and I was up at the embassy, and looking through the papers, I found New York Times, the Daily Times, which had a fairly big review, which I read through about two or three times, and couldn't make up my mind if it was favorable or not. Mm -hmm. So I went home with it, and there John Steinbeck, with whom I was traveling, kind of was looking at my pains. He's had a lot of experience reading reviews of his yeah. books. How did he feel about the review of your book? Oh, he said first that um, if I want to be any intelligent or something like that, I should not read them. So I got ashamed, and I went usually in the bathroom to reread my review. <laughs> For the fifth uh, or sixth time. Yes, he was disapproving of the whole thing. But you liked that first review that was in the uh, New York Daily Times, Bob. No, I couldn't make up my mind. He was patting me on the back and kicking me some other place. But then we left shortly after, and when we got to Prague, I wanted to buy every American newspaper, sure enough eager for other kind of information and little bit seeing if my book is in it. So I found Time magazine, and my terrific surprise, Time magazine was kind of favorable. It was well, they thought you were one of the family a little bit. Yeah, but well, they like to be mean to the family. Oh, that's <laughs> true. That's true. So you felt better in Prague than you had oh, in Oh, in Prague, I, I was sure now I made it. But from there, I had to run down to Budapest, and then I found other magazine, which again, mm-mm say that the pictures were terrific, but as a writer, I was frivolous. Oh. <laughs> so then, flying home, Gander, I found the Sunday Herald Tribune, which said that I, I was just like a kind of miniature Goya or something like that, and that made me feel terribly well. They said you were great. Oh, terribly great, and I was in every respect all right. So unfortunately, I bought the Times again, and there was the Sunday Times reviewer who declared that I was about the dullest man he ever read. Oh, how <laughs> so awful. You, you I hope you kept reading the Tribune. No, what happened to me, I haven't seen a review since then. You haven't? No. John, in other words, now you're taking John Steinbeck's advice. Oh. Incidentally, I understand that, that he... We won't name the hotel where he works, but I understand that he got you out of bed this morning, cooked your breakfast... Does he do that every morning? Oh, he's writing very hard on a Russian trip, and uh, we work kind of together on it. He gets up early and cooks breakfast. Can't deny that. Is John <laughs> Steinbeck a good cook? Yeah, he's a very good cook. He <laughs> can make sub-boiled eggs in three and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well, now let's get back to the story of your shooting in Russia, and by shooting, I mean photography. I don't mean being shot at or shooting at somebody. Yes, let's get back about the trip and find out about the trip. Well, now, how, how was it working in Russia? I mean, we, we on this side of the Iron Curtain, Bob, we, we get an idea that you've got 16 guys with guns looking over your shoulder every time you take a step, and then you have to battle sensors to get anything through. What is it like working with a camera on the other side of the Iron Curtain? You see, you say it already twice, Iron Curtain, and uh, I don't know, I do think the main Iron Curtain is a kind of pocket Iron Curtain. Everybody is carrying it in its own head. The other Iron Curtain, I don't know, it does exist a little bit maybe as, difficult as borders are concerned, but I didn't have much trouble. You mean you shot whatever you wanted to and, uh, and, and had no trouble with censorship? Oh, this never happens that way, you know no, that. No, it isn't. I, I'm going to say, that's too perfect. Uh, but I was last winter in Turkey to shoot a movie for March of Time. Certainly it was a 
county which was supposed to be friendly or disposed in Russia. And they had all interest too that I get that picture through. And I had certainly more difficulties to shoot in Turkey than I had in Russia. Well, now, how would it compare working under an American press censor during the war and Russia today? Uh, now, this is again something very di uh, different, and I would not compare. I just brought up Turkey for no other reason than to say that there are different parts of the world where cameras and press was always a kind of taboo. And more east you get, less they like you with a camera for many, many reasons. And most of them no good. But, Bob, you said that you didn't even have the correct papers to cover all the cameras and film that you took with you on your trip to Russia. I had none, really, because um, we just applied for our visas and uh, here in New York, and we were in Paris when we got them. Kind of from one day to the other, we could not go to the consulate to get some special papers, and we figured that our airplane would put us down at Moscow Airport, and there will be some kind of if not red carpet, but some small carpet laid out on which I can bring in my films. The way how it happened, we came in from Stockholm, and our airplane came down in Leningrad for custom inspection, and uh, two Russians came into the plane and opened every suitcase and asked, what is that? And I said, film. And then he said, Harasho, and I said, what's that? And I said, more film. Then he says, no. I said, da. And then looked again and thinks they are flashbulbs. So I said, no, da, and he closed everything. And, and that meant, all right, you can come on into Russia with, with yeah, your film. Yeah, and then and we equipment. got to the Moscow airfield and found no carpet of any color. Indeed, nobody asked for passport or anything, but nobody was there even to take us to town. So we hitchhiked in for four days. Nobody even realized that we were there. We'd been sleeping in borrowed beds in the Hotel Metropole. And after that, we kind of got somebody who came along with us, and when we asked that we wanted to go to Stalingrad, then we got to Stalingrad. And when we said we wanted to see Georgia, we went to Georgia. This whole thing was a great surprise to us and everybody else. But I should think because you and John Steinbeck were, were shooting pictures and writing a story for the Herald Tribune and also a book that they would have uh, planned your trip, even the Herald Tribune office in Moscow would have arranged your, your uh, moves. Uh, you are overestimating the influence of established American newspaper in Moscow because unfortunately for themselves, they cannot do anything like that. So they were rather and rightly jealous of our trip. I think it had much to do with maybe Steinbeck's reputation and maybe very much to do that we said from the beginning what we wanted to do, which was a very simple thing that we just wanted to not to go into politics, but see how those people live. And we say that we are going to write and photograph everything what we see, that we are not going to be favorable or unfavorable from the beginning, but we never promise that we are going to not to say something what we want to say for or against them. No, somehow they trusted that attitude much more than people who go in saying that they are terribly favorable and become professionally unfavorable at the moment I get out. Tell me, uh, did you have much trouble getting your film out? Now, what, what, what happened when you brought all your negatives oh, back? Oh, that was a funny story because, you see, during that whole time I was trying to get a decision on censorship. And I never was told if I can bring those films out uncensored, developed, undeveloped, etc. The very last day before we left, suddenly I got a telephone call to turn all my films in to censorship. So a young man came, I gave him my films and was rather unhappy for 24 hours. Next morning on the airfield, a young man came back and he had a box and the box had strings around it and a plumb on it. A what on it? A plumb. You know, a seal. A seal. Oh. And I said... This seal you need for the border, so you cannot take it off. On the border, someone will take it off of your films. So I was flying that plane with that sealed box in my hand. Uh, and I know, they didn't tell me if they cut something out or not. They didn't tell me if there are films in it or sand. 
So I shook the box. I kind of wait to that figuring, is it the same weight that it was before? And I was really sweating. In Kiev, they took off the seal, and when the plane took off again in the air, I began to drag out those 3,000 negatives to try to find out what was missing. And I you found that film was in there. They hadn't replaced your film with sand. No, no, they hadn't replaced it. Most of it was in. Indeed, very little was missing, and uh, rather unimportant ones, I think, just to... To prove that they could sense it. Yeah, just, you know how sensors are. I yes. certainly do. Well, Tex and Bob Kappa, here's a story that, that no censor would want to kill, and I want to tell you about it right now. Tex, did you ever have Sabrin coffee in ever anyone else's home? Sure, James. Lots of times. Why? Well, wasn't it just as rich and good as it is when, when we have it at home? I thought you were going to say when you make it. Of course it was, Jenks, but what are you driving at? Well, I'm just proving that no matter who makes Sabrin coffee, it's always richer tasting, and that's because Sabrin is richer tasting coffee. You see, this is a cagey question, because you never know if you have a price picture or not. But because when you shoot, nearly every picture is the same to you. And the price picture is born in the imagination of editors and public who sees them. I had once uh, one picture which was appreciated much more than the other ones, and I certainly did not know when I shot it that it was a specially good picture. It happened in Spain was very much at the beginning of my career as a photographer and very much at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. And war was kind of romantic, if you can see anything like that. No, I can't. <laughs> it was there because it was in Andalusia and those people were very green, they were not soldiers and they were dying every minute with uh, great gestures and um, they figured that was really for liberty and the right kind of fight. They were enthused. And I was there in the trench with about 20 milicianos, and those 20 milicianos had 20 old rifles. And on the other hill facing us was a Franco machine gun. So my milicianos been shooting in the direction of that machine gun for five minutes and then stood up and said, Vamonos, and get out from the trench, and began to go after that machine gun. Sure enough, the machine gun opened up and moved them down. So what was left of them came back and again take pot shots in the direction of the machine gun, which certainly was clever enough not to answer. And after five minutes again, I said, Vamanus, and they got moved on again. This thing repeated itself about three or four times, so the fourth time I just kind of put my camera above my head and even didn't look and click the picture when they moved over the trench. And that was all. I didn't develop my pictures there, and I sent my pictures back with a lot of other pictures. But I took, I stayed in Spain for three months, and when I came back, I was a very famous photographer because that camera which I hold above my head just caught a man at the moment when he was shot. So that, that was a great picture. That was probably the best picture I ever took. I never well. saw I never saw the picture in the frame because the camera was far above my head. Of course, there's one uh, condition that you've got to create yourself, Bob, uh, in order to get a lucky picture like that. You've got to spend a lot of time in trenches. Now, this habit I would like to lose. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember seeing you after you'd spent a lot of time in trenches in two or three ends of the last war, and uh, somehow you never managed to lose the habit for very long. I won't lose the habit. I hope that other people will lose the habit to create those trenches. Mm, yeah, I know what you mean. But, Bob, while we're talking about the beginning of your career, I think uh, let, let's go back to the thing that John Hersey said about you, that you're the man who invented yourself. Can you tell us that story? Yes, I just would like to say that a little bit is John Hersey who invented the man who invented himself or something like that. You see, there are so many inventions going around about me that... I rather let the impression going around that the, all of them are true. That will confuse everybody. I'm uh, the man of mystery. You mean we're not going to get this true story from you, Bob Kappa? Oh, John wrote it already, and it's kind of corny kind of story, because sure enough, I had a name which was a little bit different from Bob Kappa. That was a long time ago in Paris, around 1934, 1935. And that real name of man, mine was not too good. You know, it was, was a young man, kind of just as foolish as I am now, but younger. And on my own name, I couldn't get assignment anymore. 
and I kind of decided at that moment that it's time for me to be a working man, a great photographer, and etc. And I needed a new name very badly. What, what was your old name? Oh, it's very embarrassing for me to say something there. It began with Andre, and it was Friedman. The two of them hang together, and let's discard it for a minute. All right. So I was figuring on a new one, and I figured that something like Robert would sound very American, because that was how somebody had to sound, and figured Kappa again sounding as American or something, and figured it's easy to pronounce. So Bob Kappa sounded like a good name to me, and then I invented that Bob Kappa was a famous American photographer who came over to Europe and did not want to bother with uh, French editors because they didn't pay enough. And that was a period when a lot of news happened in France, from popular came strikes, etc. So I just sneaked in with my little Leica, took some pictures and put Bob Kappa in it, which we sold for double prices. So you went around selling the work of a non-existent cameraman. Oh, I was I was uh, known as his uh, darkroom man. Oh, I see. You were his darkroom man. Yeah. The mysterious Bob Kappa. Yeah, then one day it got discovered, and since then I stayed on to be Bob Kappa, and it's quite comfortable. You just decided to stick to the name because you liked the American-sounding Bob. Is no. that how you came to America? I mean, when you picked an American name, or had you been here before? No, no, it, uh, my family was here then already, but I hadn't. So I came shortly after that to legalize my name. Indeed, about Bob is something different. I knew Robert. I didn't know that uh, Robert is Bob. Would I have known that? I don't know. <laughs> and, and even your brother, who's now a very good photographer for Life magazine, his last name is Kappa, too. Yes, he couldn't do anything about it, but he kept his first name, which is funny. Cornell. Yeah. I think that's a very funny name. That it's a good name. It comes over very well because it's the name of an American college. I don't know if uh, that makes him happy. Oh. <laughs> we'll start calling you Harvard Kappa for the rest of this program, Bob. Ooh. <laughs> Look, now, this, we, we're getting some good stories out of you. There's another one I've heard, a legend, about a well-known general and how you made him miss his Thanksgiving dinner. That happened in England before I got there, and I've always wanted to know... The true story. As you were lucky, because you became P.R.O. of the Air Force just about one month after that thing happened. Because in 1942, when the Air Force just got over to England, I went out to Cheltenham, it was, to take pictures of the first fortresses going over to Europe. You remember that time, flying conditions were bad, and we didn't have much experience, so mostly we've been staying indoors in the nice English mud, and briefed in the morning and never flew. And uh, that's when I uh, got introduced to poker. Those poker? Yes, the game of cards? No, game of skill. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> game of chance. <laughs> no, no, it's a game of skill. Okay. Or the All right, poker. <laughs> the manly art of self-destruction, yes. how we call it. Anyway, those boys had a lot of new things like high and low and the red dog and bishop's wife and things like that, which I never heard about. And I was losing uh, my expense account quite freely. The games usually lasted till early in the morning. And one morning, when it looked all right to take off, I went out with the boys and took some pictures. And those pictures somehow went through the sensor without any kind of censorship because they didn't see anything what would have been objectionable in it. One of them said there's a little black thing which I don't know anything about it in the nose, but it, sound, it looks all right. So about next week, an English magazine wanted to reprint my pictures and put on the cover the beautiful shot where I had a young man standing in the nose of the fortress, fortress behind him and the little black thing in the nose. Unfortunately, the little black thing turned out to be the secret bomb site, and that day was Thanksgiving Day, and the king invited General Eker and General Spatz, who had to leave the dinner, and I was terribly much in disgrace for a long time, indeed, more than that. You mean you held up General Akers and Spatz's dinner with the King of England? I had done that, and I got court-martialed, and I got court-martialed on the way that I became a legal war correspondent. But for this story, everybody will pay $3.15 to read my book. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. I'm glad. You shouldn't tell every bit of the stories, Bob, because they're so good, you should just tell the beginning, and then everyone will have to buy your book slightly out of focus. 
the name and get the rest of the story. Oh, we are good friends. We are plugging like crazy here. Oh, <laughs> and how. I love that name. Slightly out of focus in text. You wanted to call something just focus. Yeah, that's another story, too. But now, while we're getting stories, Bob, I think this is a, a very good story that I'd like to get without having to read your book again. The story about the last man killed in the war and the picture you took of that. Oh, yes. Uh, that was in... Um just before Leipzig, it was obvious that the war was just about being over because we knew that the Russians were already in Berlin and that we had to stop shortly after taking Leipzig. And we got into Leipzig after some fight, just had to cross one more bridge. The Germans put up some resistance so we couldn't cross. And that was a big apartment building which overlooked the bridge. So I figured I'm going to get up on the last floor there and I will get a nice picture of Leipzig or something in the last minutes of fight. So I climbed up four floors and I got in a nice bourgeois apartment where on the balcony was a very nice young man, a young sergeant, who put up a heavy machine gun to cover the crossing. And uh, he was first putting out this machine gun in the window but was not comfy enough, so he just moved out on the open balcony and put up that heavy machine gun. I came out there too and kind of looked at him to take a picture of him, but God, the war was over. Who wanted to see one more picture of somebody shooting? We've been doing that same picture now for four years and everybody wanted something different. And by the time this picture would have reached New York anyway, probably the headline would have been peace. So it made no sense whatsoever. But he looked so clean cut and he was one of the men who looked like if it uh, would be the first day of the war. He still was earnest about it. So I said, all right, this will be my last picture of war. And I put my camera and took a portrait shot of him. And while I shot my portrait of him from two yards, he got killed by a sniper. It was a very clean, somehow very beautiful death, and I think that's what I remember most from this war. And that was the last, you think, probably the last man killed during the official war. That's right. I'm sure that there were many last men who were killed. But uh, he, could, he was the last man maybe in our sector and was just about the real end of the war. Some it was kind certainly a picture of the uselessness of war. Very much so. And for me it was certainly a picture to kind of remember because I knew that the day after people be will begin to forget. So it was a kind of clean definition. Uh, this was the last who will not forget the war. Well, Bob Kappa, we're going to try to get you back on this program again and again. I know you're talking with John Steinbeck at the Herald Tribune Forum this week, but we want to get in our invitation now to come back whenever you can wake up this early in the morning. Yes, and remember that everyone can read these stories and more in Bob Kappa's book, Slightly Out of Focus, and the stories of Russia. They'll have to wait for John Steinbeck's book. And Bob Kappa's pictures. Thank you very much, Bob Kappa. And now, Tex, we have a follow-up story that we talked about the other day about Orbach's new garage parking service for their customers. Yep, it's working out beautifully. A typical chapter of the Orbach story.